Welcome to Whose Voices Are We Amplifying? Source Tracking 101. I'm Sarah Shariari, the Director of Leadership and Talent Development at INN. We will save time for questions at the end of these amazing lightning rounds. So please just drop your questions in the chat as we move along and we'll address as many of them as we can at the end. Now, thinking about whose voices are we amplifying? We all want to reflect and serve our communities through journalism. But if we aren't hearing the voices of people from across the community, and that includes people from different racial and ethnic backgrounds, genders, and zip codes, then we're certainly failing to reflect and serve our communities and all their richness. But how can we gather information that helps us make informed decisions and do better work? How do we know we aren't sourcing the same people over and over again, and instead make time to form new relationships? Today, we're gonna to learn from six different newsrooms that, embar that embrace source tracking as a first step toward answering those questions. Several of these presenters are from public radio member stations, and I wanna acknowledge the people at NPR who put a lot of work into source tracking and into sharing their knowledge, particularly the great Keith Woods. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce this powerhouse panel of INN members. Here is our moderator, Corey McLagan. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, we are fortunate to have a fantastic panel today. I am joined by Jennifer Hackwolf from The Beacon in Kansas City, Susanna Capaluto from WABE in Atlanta, Jadon Marshall from WFAE in Charlotte, LaShawn Hudson of WABE, and Matthew Long Middleton of KCUR in Kansas City. Thank you all for being here. All these journalists have incredible insight on source tracking. As for me, I'll be starting a new public radio job on Monday, but until last month, I was managing editor of the Texas Tribune, uh, where I launched a source diversity project. So um, last year, let's see if I can move this slide. Last year, as the pandemic began, journalists interviewed scientists and doctors about coronavirus. And those experts often happen to be men. When women did offer their expertise, they were often second guessed or harassed online, according to this story in the Washington Post. The consequences are far reaching, the article says. The marginalization of female experience and expertise colors the information available to policymakers, forming coronavirus responses, which means interest in issues important to women make it under prioritized. The article continues, the dynamic has perpetuated a war framing around, around the virus, reinforcing the gendered stereotype that men are more reliable in emergencies and as decision makers. Meanwhile, after George Floyd's death, journalists around the country pushed for more diversity inside their newsrooms and raised questions about the stories their newsrooms chose to prioritize and the sources their journalists chose to interview. So the events of 2020 raised the question, whose voices are we amplifying? The Texas Tribune launched a source diversity project last year that was inspired by the BBC. The goal was to ensure our sources reflect the diversity of Texas, a state that's about 40% Hispanic, 12% Black, and 5% Asian. And the way we did that is to track the race, ethnicity, and gender of the people featured in our journalism. That means there's a number of things we're not tracking, like age, sexual orientation, disability status, and religion. Those are all important, but we wanted to be careful not to make the project so complicated that journalists or sources wouldn't participate. Our plan was to launch the pilot in March of 2020, but then the pandemic happened. We reimagined the pilot as a summer project for our amazing student fellows. Then we did another pilot with staff in the fall, and we made changes based on feedback from the two pilot groups. The pilot groups found that most sources were happy to share their demographic information with us. In March 2021, just after the winter storm in Texas, we rolled out the source diversity project to the entire newsroom. The way it works is reporters count sources quoted or paraphrased in stories under their byline. The audience team doesn't count every tweet, but they do count quote cards that we post on Twitter or Instagram because somebody made a decision to elevate that person's voice. 
The events team counts people who are featured speakers at Texas Tribune events and so on. We, we also count photos and videos. We ask sources to describe how they identify in terms of race, ethnicity, and gender. And the journalist fills out a form that includes a lot of options. So for example, we have a Middle Eastern and North African category, which is actually not a census category at this point. The Texas Tribune staffer can check multiple boxes. So if, if a source says that they are white and Hispanic, the journalist can check both of those boxes. The forms are due each Friday. And the message to the newsroom is that this is an organizational priority. We know everyone is busy, but this is something that is critical to our newsroom. Our journalists often have questions when they're filling out the form. So we have a Slack channel to answer those. What will we do with the data we collect? With the help of our data visuals team, we'll analyze it and see what it tells us. I'm going to guess that people of color are underrepresented in our journalism. I'm going to guess that most of the politics experts we interview are men. The idea is that counting will actually lead to change, but we're also going to use the data to set specific goals. We'll train staff on how to find sources and we'll celebrate our progress. I've just left the Texas Tribune, but I know this project is in great hands with my former colleagues, Mandy Kai, Emily Goldstein, and Darla Cameron. And now I'm gonna turn this over to Jennifer. Hi, I'm Jen Hack Wolf with The Beacon. I'm uh, the Kansas City Beacon and also launching this summer, the Wichita Beacon. And I think like a lot of nonprofit newsrooms, we're a really small, lean team with uh, big, uh, big goals in terms of diversity. But we realized last summer um, among the um, Black Lives Matter protests that we needed to speed up the pace of our work. And so we were really lucky that as a team, we found a very strong DEIB training that we could do together. And that helped us have a shared understanding of some of the systemic inequities in our specific community, but also what that means for our country. And this helped us prioritize what we wanted to do in terms of our commitment to our community. And source diversity tracking was at the very top of that list. So this is the, the exact questions that we talked over together as a team. That was really key for us was that, um, you know, there were, there's a lot of great examples of source tracking efforts out there, and you're going to hear some of them today. But we felt very strongly that our team needed to design what was going to work for our newsroom and for our community because we're, we are unique. So we had a really open, vulnerable conversation, including um, discussing any discomfort we might feel with being accountable and how we were going to work through that. Um, so I'll move on to the to the next slide. We've been in this effort for uh, I think about eight months now, and the trickiest part for us has been keeping that momentum. Um, we were really excited to get started. So how do you how do you keep that going all of the time? So number one, get everyone in the organization involved in the effort. So for one one thing I'll tell you is that for Kansas City, we have an effort that's going well, but we're not going to simply copy and paste it for the Wichita newsroom because it's a different audience and it's a different community and a different newsroom. And so we think they need to design it so that they feel excited about it. We have a lot of ongoing conversations about diversity and the diversity tracker specifically. We talk about it at our weekly meeting and that has been a really key development for us in this because initially we kind of thought we could just set it and forget it and then our numbers would just magically improve and people would do the work and that's not how it works. So we talk about it every single week and that's been just kind of opened us up to some really good conversations. Uh, we bake in a little healthy competition. So I give little updates on where the numbers are trending. And I think that helps everyone feel invested in continuing to participate and, and keep up the good work and celebrate those little wins. And then um, you may need to pivot to get the workflow right. We uh, we didn't design it just perfectly the first time. We we had several missteps and, and uh, tried to go at it from different directions. And that's all documented in the INN case study. So um, just because you don't get it right the first time, keep keep, keep at it. This isn't, this isn't easy work. And then finally, I think the trickiest part that we're all aspiring to, how do you create that culture of trust? So how can you keep people wanting to 
engage in this work when we're in an industry where failure could mean that you're not with the team anymore. So we have to keep everyone comfortable to want to have these conversations. And for us, the frequency of the conversations has been really key. Um, so happy to answer any questions later. Good luck with all your efforts and thank you. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Um, and uh, we're going to hear now from Susanna. Hello, can you all hear me? Good. Yes, we can. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for having me. Um, now, our station is in Atlanta. And of course, we do have a very diverse um, audience already. Um, and our reporters were always aware, you know, that we needed to reflect our diverse communities. But we never really had any kind of way of tracking it until we got a grant last um, year from America Amplified. We were part of the America Amplified initiative around voting and reaching out to communities, underrepresented communities through engagement journalism. And we realized that America Amplified had developed a tracker. And so I contacted Matthew, who helped on the tracker. I said, can you make one for us? And he goes, sure. So that was sort of the, the easiest part. And then I went to our reporters and said, you know, we're going to start a, how about it? We're going to start a tracker. And they were really right on board. There was nobody who was sort of saying, why are we doing this? It was very clear to all of them. I even had some of our reporters that were doing their own tracking already on the side, just about their sources so that they made sure that they had diverse sourcing. So um, I got with Matthew and we kind of figured out, I wanted something simple because this is something that I knew had to be in reporters and producers workflow so I said, well, what we want to know first is we just want to know um, gender. Uh, we want to know um, race, ethnicity, of course, and then the type of source to make sure we're not just talking to experts and politicians. I wanted to, of course, because of America Amplified, also know how many regular people are heard on our airwaves. And I, the numbers we wanted was something close to the, um, the, the, the metro Atlanta region is, is kind of what our goal was. So um, we started the tracker and it was different. I mean, it was a different, it was one more task, right? That people had to do. So I started having um, every Friday, I would say, hey, here's your friendly reminder, fill out your tracker. People had to sort of get it into their workflow. And so we collected the data and then we wanted accountability because right now, you know, it's nice that I know the numbers and what's happening and we talked about it internally, but, you know, we are a public radio station. We have a board. I made reports to the board. Here's where we stand. And they decided to publish the data on a, so we did our first, what you see here is our first public. This is what the public can see. Um, you know, the data that we have of the first three months, I think this is, this is just sort of an example. Um, and um, you can go to our website, go here, source diversity, and that will be updated every three months. And we, you know, warts and all. And we found, of course, that what's underrepresented for us is the Latinx community still and the AAPI in Atlanta. And that's also in the description. And that is something that we're talking about. Um, so that is basically where we are. One advice I have is if you do a tracker, you have to have a ringmaster, um, which right now by default, I am the ringmaster. So the early iterations of the sheet we had was very complicated and we simplified it a little bit. LaShawn can talk about that a little bit to make it easier to get it into the workflow. That is what's important. Um, you know, once you have your staff convinced to do this and they understand why you're doing it, the other part is truly making sure it becomes just part like filling out your whatever paycheck form or whatever you need to do in paperwork um, because you do need the data and, and you need to be patient. You know, I get reporters or producers, they say, look, I haven't had any time in the last two weeks. What's the last entry I have? And then I go on the back end and figure it out. So you have to be patient if you do it, but um, if you are, you may get some good results that hopefully will make for better diversity, you know, in your news, in your sourcing. So happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Susanna. So patience and a, and a ringmaster, <laughs> got it. Um, 
we're going to go now to Jadon about um, WFAE in Charlotte. Thank you. So I joined WFAE four years ago, and we decided to make a big push for increasing the diversity of voices in our stories and on our shows. Um, over that time, anecdotally, we had heard that from the community that they were noticing the changes, but we couldn't state with certainty by how much that had changed. So last fall, we really decided to jump into diversity tracking. We spent a couple of months talking about how to do this within our own newsroom and talking to people who had already gone before us. So NPR had a big emphasis around source tracking. We talked to them about best practices. And then we really started talking to the staff, which was quite nervous about how to ask these questions of community members. And so we had to really work through that. Um, reporters ran through scenarios with us where they felt some questions might feel inappropriate. But we reminded reporters that it's not their role to shield people from questions that they choose to answer. So just like in reporting, people can choose to answer or not answer questions. We, you know, we told them to give people that same option, but to also explain to people why we were doing this, explain to people why it would be helpful. Did we lose Jadam? I am having trouble hearing her. Is that, um, Jadam, are you there? To our journalism and why it would be helpful to our service. I'm here, can you hear me? We can hear can you now. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. There was just a little a break where we lost okay. a, a minute. Mm -hmm. Okay, so fortunately we had already been asking these kinds of questions through surveys and getting a good response. We were explaining to people why we were asking. And so the response rate was really high, but we knew we needed to arm our journalists with a script of exactly how to position this to the community. So we told them um, to explain, you know, why we need this information, how it would help us, how it would serve the community. And we asked things like city, gender, race and ethnicity, age, party affiliation. And we took a couple of snapshots. So back in last fall, when we got around 600 entries in our database, we found that 41% of the people we talked to were unidentified by race. This is just looking, I'm just gonna run through the race numbers with you. 30% were white, 26% were black, 3% Latino and 0.3% Asian. We analyzed again in March. At that point, we had 1100 unduplicated sources in the database. 62% of those were white, 29% were black, 7% were Hispanic, and 1% Asian. And then this June, I did another analysis. We had 1,500 unduplicated sources. 61% of those were white, 30% Black, 6% Latino, 2% Asian, 0.4% Native American, and then 0.6% unknown. Um, and then our biggest takeaway of how it changed our listening audience is that from 2015 to now, we've seen our Black listeners increase 100% over that time. So we do see a change in when we show up for the community in these ways they show up for us. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, we're gonna go now to LaShawn. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, so I currently use the, the diversity tracker at my station. I've been using it for now for I think since August of last year. And um, it's been a wonderful, wonderful tool to use. Um, before, my tele before I became a radio journalist, I worked in television as a news producer. And during that time, we used a similar tracker. And also every day when I put a newscast together, I always thought about you know, making sure that I was telling diverse stories and who were we talking to even with using mugshots and things like that. So I had a visual perspective of who we were talking to and who we were interviewing. But on the, on the radio side, it's different because it's all audio. You don't get to hear that. You don't get to see who you're talking to. Um, and so I was extremely excited when I learned that we were getting a similar tracker to the one that I used when I was in, te in television news. Um, and it has, the biggest thing is just figuring out when to fill it out. <laughs> Because um, I have, as you know, I'm a producer and reporter. So I'm always busy writing stories in between Zoom meetings and things like that. And so just figuring out, okay, how can I 
incorporate this in my work schedule because it is another task that you have to complete. And so what works well for me is maybe um, once a week, every once a week, just filling out for that whole entire week, um, the people that we talk to. And for me, it has been transformative because I always think about who we're talking to on my show. I work for one of our flagship shows and it's kind of like a news and talk public affairs show. And so um, most recently, last week, I was putting together a I was putting I was putting it together some story ideas and I was thinking about what's happening in India with COVID-19. And I was like, oh my God, we haven't, I have we have not heard from anyone um, from India that could really speak to the issues that are happening right now in India as it relates to COVID-19. So that was something immediately that I started to attack and started looking for sources and people that we could actually get on the show that could talk about what's happening in India. Um, so I think overall, I mean, it's a wonderful tool to have, to know who you're talking to, to make sure that basically you're telling diverse stories. And in that, when you're telling diverse stories, you're able to reach a, a, a bigger audience, which then will attract more people into your newsroom, more people to your, to your website to listen to you. So you're gaining viewers, you're gaining listeners, you're gaining readers because you have, you have, you have something that you have the content that looks like them. You're hearing from people that look like them. Um, one of the things that I recently found out about the tracker that has kind of been a, that I found out recently was that an easier way to fill it out. So we had a, a model at first that wasn't, that wasn't as user-friendly. <laughs> and since then we have since changed it to make it much easier. So for me, because I work for a show, a new show, um, we're talking to multiple guests within our show. So I may have maybe four to five guests in one show. And so having to build a tracker for each person is a lot or for each person that I have to write a web story is a lot. So I recently figured out that we can actually just do for the entire show, put all five people in there. And that is much, much easier. <laughs> and uh, I've saved a lot of time. <laughs> and thank you. That's all I have to share. <laughs> Thanks so much, LaShawn, and, and let's go now to Matthew uh, from KCUR. Hey, everybody. Uh, can you all hear me, firstly? Yeah, OK, yeah. some good nods. Um, so yeah, uh, I am part of LaShawn's uh, pleasure and her horror uh, in terms of the diversity tracker, because um, when I made it with uh, Susanna in uh, WABE, I was a part of America Amplified, as I uh, believe was mentioned a little earlier. Mm -hmm. But I've been doing this work for a little while, uh, both when I produced a talk show at KCUR called Central Standard. I did it internally there. Um, and uh, I've also done it for the station as a whole. And we're rolling out a, yet a newer version of it. Um, because like as we're kind of learning here, there are just a lot of questions about um, what do you track and how do you track it? And uh, I guess what I would try to say is like, so as LaShawn was pointing out, there's always this tension in like kind of like a data engineering balance kind of thing between, you know, how complicated and nuanced can our data be and how will we actually get it? Um, because the thing that we lost when we changed um, WABE's tracker from putting in individual sources into a Google form, for example, um, and so each source for each story, you're entering, you're entering, you're entering. What we gained from that was the intersectionality of identities. So for example, like we could then cut up the data to be like, you know, when we talk to men, how many of those men are black? How many of those men are white? Um, but in the current iteration of the form, it is much faster for the reporters to fill out, right? But uh, the thing we lose then is that intersectionality of uh, identities. So, and, and that can be, for example, an okay thing, um, particularly, you know, I think the decision that we kind of came up with was that like, we want to understand the larger problem first. And, you know, like maybe, maybe down the line, maybe six months, maybe a year from now, we have to find a new way of collecting this information that allows us to find that intersectionality. Um, so I guess like some of my advice would be think about 
what you want to know first before um, going down that line. Uh, I feel like another conversation I've had with a lot of different people across the system is, uh, you know, like, well, what do we do with this information? And, uh, you know, like, I think collecting it is really good. And I think that many organizations were very much at the beginning parts of this about like, okay, so I'm starting to notice trends. But um, I am of the opinion that this should definitely change our work. Um, the, the thing I like to say, and some of you are going to roll your eyes because you've heard me say it too many times, uh, is, uh, you know, that this shouldn't dictate editorial choices, but it should definitely inform them. And by that, I mean, like, maybe you are an editor and you're working with a reporter and you're discovering, like, uh, this reporter who covers the state house is always talking to older white men. Um, like, we should look at that. Like, who are we giving voice to? Who are we amplifying? Do we need to always get their quote for spot coverage? Or should we paraphrase what they're saying and actually try to get someone from the community to give their perspective on what that means to them, if anything. Um, so I think if this work is done well, it will challenge us. Um, and I've probably taken a little bit too much time, but I'm gonna to try to just share my screen here. Let me see if this actually works. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, um, so the way that, um, this is not W an example of the most current iteration that WABE uses, but it is the one we just initiated at KCUR. Um, where we're trying to like essentially meld the two options between having intersectionality of identity, um, but also making it easier for uh, reporters to fill out. So uh, at case you are in this most recent iteration, we were just interested in essentially three types of information here, gender, race, ethnicity, and home zip code um, as a proxy for both geography, um, but also for median household income. But uh, so each reporter and producer gets their own sheet and all the variety of reports and producers who work with their editors that shared in one folder. So just them and just their editors can see it. Um, and it's up to them about what they fill in here in terms of like how detailed they want to be. But they can just go through and be like, you know, this is a test source. This is the story headline. And it was a spot. It was also a digital. It was also a feature. And it was filed today. And we talked to a man and that man happened to be white because he was me and he lives in 64110 and he did end up in the story. Um, and so what will happen is, is that this sheet will get fed into yet another sheet where it aggregates all the different reporters and producers. As you can see, here, I made up some examples here. And then that all gets fed into a data studio and what uh, a Google Data Studio. And what's really powerful about a Google Data Studio is um, that it can, and it should, if it's working properly, yep, it went from 15 to 16 sources, it will update automatically. So the work of generating reports uh, is streamlined. Uh, I provide this Data Studio feed or the analogous of it to everyone at KCUR, all the internal you know, reporters, editors and such. So anyone can come in at any time and just see not only how they're doing in aggregate, like as a station, like how are we breaking down by gender and race, ethnicity, um, but I can also segment the data. So like, for example, again, like when we talk to men, what is their race and ethnicity? I can reselect that to, to do that. Um, but I can also see like, oh, here's producer one, here's reporter one, here's reporter two. Um, obviously we would use people's names or initials to figure that out, but I can see how I'm doing and I can see how I'm comparing to my colleagues um, and, uh, and see changes over time. So Data Studio is just an incredibly powerful tool for uh, helping to streamline that uh, data analysis part of it. Um, because essentially, I, someone was saying in an earlier session, I take something and then I break it. Essentially, I don't think Google ever intended me to use these tools in this way, but I'm kind of forcing them to do what I want them to do so that um, it's free and also uh, accessible to pretty much everybody and um, something that can be uh, amended and also analyzed uh, in real time. So we're not having to spend valuable staff time just constantly recomputing the numbers um, and we can watch ourselves in real time. 
So I'm, I'm sure I'm way over time, but I appreciate everybody's patience and no, it's thanks great. so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Matthew. And, and thanks to all the, the panelists for sharing um, what's been going on in their newsrooms. We have some time for questions, so so feel free to, to put them in the chat. And I'll just start with, with some questions that I saw earlier in the chat. There was there were some folks wanted to know a little bit about how y'all are asking people for the demographic information. And Jadon, I was wondering if we could go to you because you said it was you ask you allow people to self-identify. But could you explain a little bit about how how exactly you do that? So at the end of every interview, um, we close out the interview and thank them for taking the time to talk to us. Mm -hmm. And then we ask permission to ask them a few more unrelated questions to help us do a better job in our reporting. And so basically our setup is WFAE's newsroom strives to reach out to diverse sources. We want diversity in terms of race, gender, age, where people live and viewpoints. So in an effort to see how we're doing, we wanna learn a little bit more about the people we talk to, all of these questions are voluntary and will only be used to help our newsroom. And then we go into the actual questions. Um, and so when we get to any of these, right, it's it's based on the information that they, they're telling us. So we ask about race and ethnicity and whatever they tell us, we document. Okay, got it. And, and Jennifer, you said also that, that you allow people to self-identify, but that you have a, a set number of... Um, a set number of options. Could you explain a little bit about how that works for you? Yeah, we're doing a Google form, but I might be hitting Matthew up for his his tracking <laughs> methods next. Um, we, we're doing the Google form, which um, reporters send out in email with similar language to what Jadon described. We did um, pivot to asking in the, um, in the interview at one point and then pivoted back to the Google form. So for us, we found that that seems more realistic to the reporter workflow. Um, yes. And it, it oh, also, but, oh, yeah. sorry, Jen, yeah. I, I would just say like from my own previous experience, I've done all of this, like I've done it where the source fills it out. I've done it where I ask the question, I've done it where you send them a form. Um, but uh, it does help with that like quote unquote awkwardness of having to ask them that direct question. And I, I do find that sometimes the form is nicer, particularly if you wanna ask more uh, intimate questions. For example, like um, when I was producing uh, the talk show, I asked about sexual orientation because that's another issue of diversity and difference that um, you know can be an impact on a story. Um, so uh, I found that that was just easier to write in a form and many, many, many people would share. Um, so. Mm -hmm. yeah, just something to think about. Thank you. Um, I want to turn to a different question. You know, I, I imagine a number of people on this call might be considering starting something like this in their own newsrooms, and they can and they can read the the great report that Sarah has shared in the chat. But but I wanted to ask y'all on the panel what what is something you wish you had known when you started, or or maybe a piece of advice that you would offer to other people who are thinking of of starting something like this. Um, Lashawn, do you want to take that? Let's see. Just, not, no, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I would just say, you know, just jump in and do it. I mean, yeah. that's really, I mean, that's the that's the biggest thing to say, really, is just mm -hmm. jump in and do it. Don't be afraid. And also do it, but also listen to the results and you know, see where you can make changes in your newsroom and your mm -hmm. storytelling. That's the best advice I would get. Yeah, can I give an example of that? Yeah, too. sure. Like when I was small. producing Central Standard, I used my source tracker or my diversity tracker in reverse. Like um, we had an issue in a specific community and I was wondering like, oh, who could be a good guest? And so instead of like doing my usual, you know, production role of like, oh, I'll call like some expert or I'll call like, you know, the city council person from there. I was like, has anyone ever been on our show? who's been in any of the zip codes in this community. So I queried my diversity tracker and uh, found those zip codes. And then I was like, oh, this woman who actually happens to be 
uh, you know, really into dance. She was on to talk in our show like months ago about something that was totally unrelated. She was, you know, to talk about like modern dance. So it was an art show before, but I called her up and I asked her, you know, would you be interested? And she's like, oh my God, thank you for calling me. I actually, my dance studio and I live in this community. She also happened to be a woman who is black. And like, so, I mean, it was, it was just this beautiful moment of, you know, she could bring a different part of her expertise and her mm -hmm. lived experience into the conversation. And that never would have happened if I hadn't been tracking my sources and using that database in like a, in a reverse way as well. So I, I think it can like really enrich our work. That's a great example. Thank you. Um, Susanna, what about, what about you? What, what advice would you offer to, to folks who are thinking of starting something like this? Well, I, like Matthew said, start small, but yeah. make sure that once you start, it is a living document and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it needs care. And like Matthew, we've been thinking that zip code is the next thing that even our reporters wanted that early on when we started talking, like, what do you want to track, you know, and they're all oh, this and that. And, but it's like in zip code, but, but, but the, to get the zip code in there, you have to give up maybe what type of source. So you really have to be specific and maybe, you know, for three months we could, track something different and then go back to some just to see like like make it a living document mm -hmm. and then have it inform your reporting and use it also when you talk to reporters and shows and show them the data and talk through it you know some of them might be surprised you know that oh we thought we were more diverse than you know the tracker might be showing or you know you'll find the gaps i guess in your in your coverage when you really use it but see it as a as a living, growing process. Great, thanks. And, and I see a question in the chat about when you're starting this, should you be looking backward to try to catalog what you've already done or looking forward? And I see, Jen, you have a, you have a thought on that. Yes, I, and, and I think it, it pairs with Matthew's advice about starting small, mm -hmm. that this, this work is hard enough without um, trying to do a, a retroactive approach. So I think forward looking is definitely easier because what's, what's key to this effort is um, your sources have to be able to self-identify. Um, we, don't, we don't assign gender or ethnicity to, to anyone. So if you were going to do this retroactively, you'd have to reach back out to everyone and that gets really complicated really fast. So, so forward looking is, is a good way to start small. And the other thing that we did for starting small is we, we only have two full time reporters and those are the only um, that's the only reporting we're tracking right now. So that catches most of our reporting, but we, we don't do everything, but we just focus on full time reporters because we feel comfortable with our understanding of their workflow and with freelance reporters that would get more complicated and we're already asking a lot of them. Great. Um, and I want to add, Corey, go ahead, please. Um, so we're trying to do a bit of both. We definitely have asked our reporters to only be forward looking in their tracking, but we've had like a producer work with us to dig back into the historical data so that we cre could create some snapshots based on when we really started pushing this. So that work is longer going. And to Jen's point, we just say unknown. When we, so when I talked about that August data where 41% of the you know, sources were unknown, we're okay with that, right? Mm -hmm. Because the focus is really how do we change this going forward? But it's helpful to know where, we, where we've come from. Mm -hmm. I can't emphasize that enough. Like a, a null data set is still information. <laughs> right you know like what we've taken an unknown unknown and making it into a known unknown and that's that's big that's big because it, it's showing you where you're still have opportunities for for growth mm -hmm. um now the point of all of this is not just to collect numbers and data right it's about the journalism so i wanted to ask the panel what what changes if any have you seen in your newsroom in terms of how you do how you do news gathering or, or who you talk to? What has been the impact of this work on your newsroom? Does anyone want to want to jump in? I'll jump in. So yeah. I had a conversation with a reporter recently who her her first question was, "Are we done yet?" <laughs> right? Like we have like all of these sources in this database. Can we stop? And yeah. so I was like, "There is no finish line for this work." Right. So no. Um, and then she said. 
you know, that she had really learned some things in the short time that she's been contributing to this. And it's made her to look differently at who she's talking to mm-hmm. for her stories. She's gone back a couple of times when she thought she was going to go in one direction and decided to expand the tent a bit to bring in some different voices. Mm-hmm. So she really noticed a difference in how it's making her think and be intentional about who and when she talks to people. Mm-hmm. LaShawn, any, any impacts that you can think about on, on your newsroom? Well, um, I can think about, I mean, it's still relatively new in my station at WABE, but I can yeah. think about when I was in television when I used a similar tracker. And so basically um, during my time there, I was there for a total of three, three and a half years. We went from being the second station in the market to number one. And I think a part of that had to do with, you know, the stories that we were telling being diverse and being intentional about who we were talking to. Um, Also, too, even when I was putting together a show, I would look at, you know, because I was the person like deciding, okay, we're going to do a video, we could, or if we're going to do a story about someone arrested and you have their mugshot, you know, maybe not run those things back to back like that, maybe put them in a, a different segment or a different block within that news within within that whole um, new segment. And so looking at it from that way and thinking about how can I diversify and tell stories differently and making sure that you're not necessarily just repeatedly showing images that could be, you know, bad for someone else to actually interpret and take in. <laughs> because I mean, that's just the reality of it. So for me, I'm always thinking about ways to um, just tell stories from a broader perspective and making sure that everyone is included um, because we all, you know, we all are human. And so we may think that we are not being biased or we're not doing this, but we don't know that. And so we have this tool that is there to lead us and guide us. And I think it's just an incredible way to make sure that we are um, telling diverse stories. Great, thank you. Um, there's some questions right now in the chat about, about how much of this should be shared publicly. Um, Susanna, I take it you share it publicly because it's- Yeah, I can talk to that. Um, yeah. So, you know, we did the tracking. Everybody was aware, upper management. I was very, um, you know, open. This is, we're going to find out how we're doing. Um, and once, you know, I presented it to our board, even this is what we're doing now. We're tracking our sources. This is important. And, the, and our board was very much, oh my God, this is great. They were like, there was really great buy-in. And I'm mm-hmm. like, hey, wait till they see the results. Are they going to then, you know, are they going to make it public, right? Are they really going to want people to know where we're at? And so they saw the results from the first and they made a commitment before, before the, um, this first quarter, we, we decided to publish them quarterly starting mm-hmm. this year. And so they made that commitment. And so what happens is I take the tracker information and our kind of marketing department kind of makes it because we take the reporters names out, you know, there's certain information we don't really want every, you know, out there. So they kind of take it and make it so it's publicly consumable, so to speak. So it look, and they, 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 you know, put the wording behind it so that, that we are um, telling people why we're doing it um, and what our, you know, faults and whatever, what our, wh- where we hope to do better kind of. So it's all out there to the public um, and it's a great accountability tool um, to have it out there, I think, because um, it, you know, keeps us on our toes. Great, and, and Jadon, you had said that you were also gonna be sharing something publicly. Which, which piece are you gonna be sharing with your audience? The, the actual percentages of um, the sources that we track. I, one of the things I want to stress, so I'm part of the North Carolina Media Equity Workshop here in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. And, you know, through that group, we've really talked about the importance of sharing this kind of information with mm-hmm. the community, right? Like there's a lot of trust building that we have to do, especially with communities of color. And I think when we're transparent about these efforts, Right, it helps even when we fall down, it helps them understand where our intentions are and how we're actually making real steps toward change. Mm-hmm. Great, well, um, thank you all so much. I am being told that we are actually out of time. So this went by really fast, but I really appreciate um, all, all of what you shared and I'm gonna turn it back over to Sarah now.
Thank you so much to Corey and to this wonderful panel. You know, when we put this together, I was really nervous because it's a big panel. But what I forgot was that most people work in radio and so they can really hit the times. So thank you all for being so generous and wonderful and sharing your work with us.